So, I think I'll stand up. So we're here today to talk about how we can upgrade and you know, influence our thoughts, our beliefs, our paradigms, our values in order to create a more beautiful world. And if our commitment is truly to create a more beautiful world, then at some point, we're gonna to have to have the conversation of how we harness and manage our resources, right? And so when we have that conversation, naturally we're gonna talk about our natural resources, our economic resources. Um, maybe we'll talk about our children as resources, like the generation of the future. But there is a resource that's even more fundamental to our being here 
and our well-being on this planet, and that's us, ourselves. We are our own greatest resource. And if we're our own greatest resource, there's so many different ways in which we can tap into that. There's so many different ways in which we uh, can bring out more and the best of ourselves. So, you know, our modern technologies uh, and tools like our communications networks, our um, data processing capabilities have really allowed us and given us so much of a, you know, a big picture view of the outer world. And that's essential, right? If, um, if we want to motivate ourselves into action, then we want to see the biggest possible picture. Because when we see the big picture, we have a better understanding of how everything is connected. We have a better understanding of cause and effect. And we can orient our actions towards the effects that we desire. In this case, a more beautiful world. And so we have all of these incredible technologies, but you know, most of them are focused on the external world, right? This outer landscape, the macrocosmos. And I ask, if we are our own greatest resource, what are we doing to see the big picture inside of ourselves? What are we doing to, to, to feel and tap into this, right? And so there's you know, many, many different ways to answer that question. And so many people here tonight have talked or today have talked about uh, wonderful ways and wonderful things. And for me, it's really been about my interaction and my journey with sound, right? Um, and you may not immediately think of sound as a resource, but it is a resource. And it's remarkable when you think about it that way because it's free, it's abundant, it's incredibly powerful. And when it's harnessed properly, we can generate value, right? So what does that mean? Well, one of the ways in which human beings harness sound to generate value is through music, right? I think we can all agree that music has um, profoundly uh, enriched our lives and our world from the beginning of its existence. Um, and so if we're looking for ways in which we can open ourselves and if we're looking for ways for which we can get into a deeper contact with you know, the essence of our being, uh, sound can be a powerful resource for that, right? And so now music has served as a, a way of communication um, it has served as a form of spiritual and emotional expression. Um, it has uh, been a, inspire, a source of inspiration and a unifying force throughout the world. And that's amazing. Here we are taking this resource, sound, that's free and abundant, and we're generating all this value out of it, right? And so then you ask yourself, well, what else? How else can we tap into sound? How else can we harness the power of sound to generate value? And, uh, you know, certainly I'm not the first person to ask that question. And in fact, if you look at our history, you see that human beings have been asking this question for a very long time and answering it in a variety of wonderful ways. And um, one of those ways is the interaction, the interactions of sound and resonant spaces, right? So, um, in our very early days, we discovered these places where sound had a different quality, right? It reacted or it, um, had a different effect than our normal everyday world. These magical places like caves and valleys. And we chose to put many of our cave paintings there, right? So like we saw earlier in the slides, um, those incredible cave paintings, a lot of those were placed in the most resonant parts of the caverns. And perhaps this was because, you know, in those places we could mimic the sounds of the animals and they would really take on a form that was uh, closer to, to reality, closer to what we, uh, we perceived, you know. And um, then we also have these uh, incredible rituals that took place in these places, right? We have, there's lots of evidence found that many rituals were brought in um, and, and done with the use of sound, harnessing the power of sound, and uh, to facilitate the, 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 the connection, the connection within. 
and the contents of these rituals have been lost to us, but the, we can certainly see the influence that they had on us based on the fact that a few years or you know, <laughs> some time period down the road, we, when we started building structures, we incorporated a lot of the same effects into their design, right? So all of these special structures like our temples, our pyramids, our cathedrals, our mosques, our churches, we build them to be resonant spaces, right? And the reason for that is that they, they, there's, by design, we realized our, our deep connection to sound and we realized that sound can facilitate these incredible states of being. And so, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to share a little bit of my story with, with sound. I actually uh, grew up believing that I had no musical aptitude, right? Because of the way music was presented to me and because of maybe you know, a variety of factors. It wasn't until my early 20s that I picked up an instrument. And even at first, even actually after a few years of playing, if you had asked me if I was a musician, I would have told you, no, you know, absolutely. I'm just, you know, I just like to pick it up and you know, it's a hobby thing. And, and it was because of this very narrow definition that I had of what a musician was and what music was. And I didn't fit it, right? And um, of course, now I, I understand that we, not only am I a musician, are we all musicians, but we are music, right? We are vibration in motion. We are this orchestrated symphony um, from the our, you know, heartbeat to the song of our breath to the whirling, spinning, buzzing world, the, you know, the quantum world that makes up our atoms. And we are music, right? And that connection and you know it's one thing for me to he say it here to you and even if it resonates but it's a very different thing to actually experience it in your body right I, I believe that on any concept in order for it to be truly transformational we have to experience it we have to feel it in our hearts we have to become it right and so resonant spaces for me have been an incredible doorway into that um, I visited a great variety of them, uh, everywhere from Japan to California to Morocco to uh, many, you know, just Providence. I ended up in these incredible places, but probably the one that left the deepest impact on me was a dome uh, outside of Berlin in a place called Teufelsberg. And uh, it's an abandoned radar station, and there's this. Uh, Ray Dome. It's a dome that was built to protect a radar antenna, which is now gone, so it's empty. And as soon as you walk in, you feel this presence, this potentiality in the air, right? It's just like it's charged with potentiality. And without, before you even make a sound, your, your consciousness has changed. You're more shifted into this, you know, expanded way of, of perceiving. You're really aware of your body and you're aware of everything that's going on. You're having even before any sound is made, this kind of unprecedented experience, right? But then when you begin to sing or play an instrument or anything, it, it just opens up and you feel this profound connection, right? You, you, because you're, you're completely bathed in sound, right? Normally when we create sounds in the outer world, they travel away from us and they get absorbed right? In these spaces, they're harnessing the sound and they're sending it right back to you. And so you get to feel your, all the energy that you're putting out comes right back and you're able to, um, and it's informed by the space itself, right? And so uh, my experience in this place was as I began to tone, um, I could feel, uh, I could hear, first of all, it sounded like there was a choir of voices singing along with me. Uh, it had a similar effect on the sound that a prism does on light, right? And so it, you could hear all of the harmonic partials that made up the tone. And then just by being really present with it and listening, you could hear where they were supporting the overall coherence of the sound and where they were maybe detracting a little bit. And just by becoming aware of that, your body naturally started to harmonize, right? Because we are self-harmonizing systems. Our bodies are always harmonizing to the environment around us, to the conditions, to new ideas. We're constantly in this flux, you know, this harmonic flux. And this 
this pla these places give you a really direct experience of that, and they open you up in, in fantastic ways. And so uh, one of the steps in which I've taken along with a couple of business partners is we've been in contact with the company that produces these domes, and we're going to be erecting them in different places around the world. One, obviously, to start out, but our, our goal is to get them in you know many different spaces so that people can come and have these experiences that are profoundly transformational. You know, um, they can be as transformational as anything that uh, I've experienced or you know I've heard about experienced with um, entheogens or psychedelic substances or things like that. You can really achieve a very profound state of change to your consciousness just with sound, right? And I think that that would be amazing, such accessibility for different people. Um, and then also, uh, my, my partner, Alan Tower, created this. I helped him with the design. So we call this the Voice Cathedral, right? And uh, this is still a prototype, but essentially, uh, the way it works is that this is a box that produces, it's called a Shruti box, it's an Indian instrument. And it produces long tones. And when you sit, you can sit into it like this. And there's a space for your hand to rest. And you can pump the bellows, and you'll begin to get tones. And as you immerse yourself in here, you're surrounded by sound in a very similar way uh, to these resonant spaces. and as you begin to sing along with it, you connect to the sound. There's this braiding that happens, and uh, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So I actually brought this here, uh, and I would like to offer that anybody who's interested in experiencing it, if, you know, quickly, obviously, if there's a lot of people, but uh, I'd love to put you through it outside. And so my vision is that we... Uh, you know, continue to move forward in harnessing the power of sound. We're already doing so much with it, but I believe it's really just scratching the surface. I think that we can use sound uh, profoundly influence and affect our ability to know ourselves, to know our world, to feel and experience a really deep sense of connection with each other. And I think that that's definitely a step in creating a more beautiful world.